This is The Last Ship Podcast, Season 3, Episode 10. Thanks for joining me for the unofficial fan podcast for the TNT drama The Last Ship. I'm Al Holtz, and this is the podcast on which I discuss, analyze, and critique the show that demonstrated that the proper use of the filibuster is to give your crew time to take back the ship. As always, I'll begin with my general impression of the episode, followed by detailed analysis of Season 3, Episode 10, titled Scuttle. I'll name the well-said moment of this week's episode, and I'll wrap up with the naval feature, Ship of the Week. So let's dive in. My general impression of this episode, this is my favorite episode of the season so far. The scuttling of the Hayward and Captain Malin's reaction was an excellent way to start this off, and it just got better from there. The scenes with Kara were by far the best scenes in St. Louis all season. Things have really heated up, and I'm in great anticipation at this point of how the last three episodes are going to wrap up this storyline. The episode opens with Kara holding a handgun looking out the window of a house. She calls for her mom, who is carrying Frankie, and the three of them head outside. In front of the house, Jed Chandler pulls up with Tom's kids. Jed tells her he needs to know what's going on, and then Ashley and Sam want to know about their dad. Kara says she will explain everything later, and she puts Frankie and her mom into the car, and Jed drives off. It was great to see the Chandler family again. It's just excellent when shows bring back recurring characters for such brief scenes as this really adds to the story and to the realism of the show. In the Nathan James Hilo Bay, the wounded from the Hayward and the Shackleton are being cared for as Lieutenant Commander Cobb enters and tells Captain Malin that it's time. Malin meets Chandler on the deck, and they both view Hayward, smoking and listing. Malin tells Chandler he was a plank holder. A plank holder is a member of the crew of a ship when the ship was first commissioned thus giving them the theoretical ownership of one of the deck planks. Slattery walks up with a detonator and tells the captains the charges have been rigged to ensure maximum damage to sensitive technical equipment. And this is, of course, why the Navy would scuttle a ship in wartime, to prevent anything from falling into the hands of the enemy, even if the ship is already too damaged to stay afloat. Slattery hands the detonator to Malin, but Malin keeps looking at Hayward and does not take it. Chandler takes the detonator and thanks Slattery. He then presses a button on the detonator, and with several large explosions, Hayward goes down. In the briefing room, Garnett tells the senior leaders they are exploring options. Captain Malin says there is only one option, we need to go home. Chandler tells him it's not that simple, and Granderson enters and hands Slattery a coded message intercepted from the destroyed Chinese ship. She suggests the cipher for the code is still aboard that ship, and they could send a team down to retrieve it. Malin says that's ridiculous, there's not enough food or fuel. He says the factory is shut down, the ship is destroyed, what else is there? And Chandler says as long as Peng is breathing, he's a threat. Chandler tells him we need to finish the mission we were sent here for, and then he orders Slattery to have Green form a dive team and find the cipher. Captain Malin is very defiant in this scene, which could of course be attributed to him having just watched his ship go down, but he's clearly coming from a completely different frame of reference than Chandler and Slattery are. Malin doesn't have the advantage of having lived through the battles with the Virni and the Achilles, nor any of the other stuff that the James crew has been through with the virus and the immunes and everything else. Outside the White House, President Oliver is giving a press conference stating that he signed an order easing restrictions on the ration card mandate, giving more local control over banking, and suspending the private property clawback regulations. He also states that he has activated the National Guard and placed them under local leadership. Barnes asks him how he accounts for these actions, and when Oliver appears stunned, Shaw tells the reporters Oliver will not be taking questions. After that, Oliver leaves. She then reports that the daily addresses will be discontinued. Clearly, post-virus, there have been new rules established for the National Guard because today, 
the guard is already under the control of the governor of each state unless they've been activated for federal duty. But in this case, Oliver's activating them and then turning them over to regional control. So that's pretty interesting. In the White House, a woman tells Shaw there's a call for her. It's Kara from a local diner. Shaw asks where she is, and Kara says she's in trouble and that Rivera and Beatty are dead and she needs help. Shaw says she will send someone to get her, and Kara tells her Shaw is the only one she can trust and that Shaw should come alone. Shaw says, okay, I'll be right there. Shortly, a car squeals up to the diner, and two men in suits get out and enter. They look around, but they don't find Kara. They exit and Kara sees them from across the street. On the James, Slattery tells Takahaya that the dive team didn't find the cipher, that pirates had gotten to it first. He asks Takahaya if he can get a message to those pirates, and Takahaya says he will try. In the Peeway, Malin tells Chandler that his crew has had a few run-ins with the pirates, and that he's lost a third of his crew and is willing to walk away from all this and from Pang. Chandler tells him, they are going to finish the mission, then he insults Malin nicely and says he has work to do. In the White House, Shaw is on the phone asking the men if they had the right diner. Roberta tells Shaw that if Chandler gets home to rally the troops, that's going to be trouble. Shaw says she's dealing with it and that the regional leaders only have a seat at the table because of her. Roberta then puts Shaw in her place and leaves. On the deck of the James, the crew is assembled with weapons drawn as pirates board up the ladder. Chandler, using Sasha as an interpreter, asks if they found the decoder. Shirahama, the lead pirate, responds that the price of the decoder is now double the agreed rations. Chandler tells him they barely have enough to feed the crew now. Takahaya says, let me talk to him, and tells Shirahama that Lao Hu killed his brother and that Chandler's crew killed Lao Hu. Shirahama responds that they have a deal at the original price. There's a great shot here where Chandler and Shirahama shake hands. The camera's on the hands and then focus pulls to Malin standing in the background just shaking his head. It's only a couple of seconds of the show, but it's very, very effective. In the White House, Oliver stares at a portrait of Abraham Lincoln as Shaw enters with her men. Shaw tells Oliver she has an order for his signature and we see it is an arrest order. He protests that no one in their right mind would sign that. Oliver continues protesting repeatedly, and Shaw replies that there are forces at work here bigger than the both of them. Oliver tells her they can stop it, and she tells him to sign it. And clearly, the forces bigger than both of them is key here, but what are those forces? These are the answers we're going to get in the next few weeks. Malin and some of the Hayward crew watch from above as the pirates load up the ration payment. On the bridge, Gator reports that passive radar is clear. Chandler tells Jeter that the new kid, referring of course to Malin, thinks that this is personal to Chandler. Jeter tells him the new kid's had a rough day. Chandler asks if Jeter thinks it's personal to Chandler, and Jeter replies with the line that was my runner-up for well-said moment this week, saying, at this point, sir... It's personal for all of us. Granderson enters and tells them the cipher checks out and that they have located Peng, that he is aboard one of the destroyers. In St. Louis, Kara arrives at Barnes' apartment and tells him to close the door. He makes a rude comment, and she tells him that Rivera and Beatty are dead. She suggests he use his press credentials to break into Senator Beatty's office and snoop around. On the James, Garnett is advised of a double-encrypted incoming transmission. She brings the message to Malin in the Hilo Bay, and Malin begins decrypting it. Malin enters the bridge and advises Chandler that he is under arrest, that Slattery is relieved of command, and that Malin is taking Nathan James back to San Diego. Chandler realizes the White House has been compromised and theorizes that Michener was killed. Granderson checks and reports that the order is valid. Malin tells them we need to get back home and sort things out, and Chandler replies that we won't get home alive, that the person that sent that order is the person that destroyed Hayward, and that we'll be sunk before we hit Pearl Harbor. Malin orders the Master at Arms to take Chandler into custody, and Slattery steps in the way to guard Chandler. Chandler orders Slattery to stand down and goes willingly. Malin relieves Granderson and Gator and asks them to leave, orders Cobb to arrest the men stealing their food, 
and orders course set for Pearl Harbor. Malin tells Slattery he has sequestered Burke, Green, and Taylor, and then reaches for the shipwide radio. Slattery tells him if he gets on and announces he has arrested Chandler, he'll need to sequester far more than that. Slattery then gets on the radio, explains what has happened, and tells the crew to perform their duties in a way customary to this ship. Now clearly, Slattery here was sending a message to his crew because customary for this ship has become something other than customary for most ships. Sasha arrives at the cabin in which Chandler is being held and tells the guards Malin has permitted her 10 minutes with him. The guards let her in. Chandler tells her she needs to ask for a court-martial and she will act as his counsel. He says Malin will have to impanel a court. Sasha tells Chandler he could be put in front of a firing squad and Chandler replies there hasn't been a military execution in the U.S. since 1961. And of course, as typical for this show, that's accurate. Army Private John Bennett was hanged in 1961 at Fort Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. Chandler tells Sasha there is a way out of this, but it involves treason, and he gives her an out. She says, tell me the plan. Barnes arrives at the Capitol building and heads to Beatty's office. He encounters a guard out front and sees men inside packing boxes. The guard tells him Beatty is out of town this week. In the James briefing room, Cobb and Malin are going through records, and Cobb says she cannot find evidence of a conversation between Chandler and Michener regarding breaking into Peng's mansion. Barnes arrives home to find Kara looking at a photo of Barnes and a pregnant woman. He tells her Secret Service were cleaning out Beatty's office. Kara calls Dennis and tells him Shaw's the leak and asks him to do something for her. It's amazing how the writers on this show managed to take a character that most, if not all, of the viewers hated early on in the season, and by episode 10, we are feeling for him having likely lost his wife and unborn child, and he's now helping Kara, and we are entirely fine with that. Bravo to the writer's room. In the James P. way, Miller and Diaz unload the vending machine as they chat with Slattery. Malin comes up, and Slattery tells him they are adding everything they can to the ration pile. Malin asks to speak with Slattery, and tells him there is no way Chandler can mount a proper defense. Slattery says they survived and found the cure because of Chandler's instincts, and maybe those instincts are right again. Malin tells him he doesn't have a choice, and Slattery says we always have a choice. Dennis arrives at Barnes' apartment, and shows him and Kara a map of the U.S. with regions clearly defined, and a number of red dots in each region. In the mess hall, Miller, O'Connor, and Diaz enter, discussing what is going on with Chandler's arrest. O'Connor makes a comment, and Miller insults him for it, then slams O'Connor's tray into his lap. They begin to fight, and suddenly the entire room is fighting. <laughs> During the fake argument here, did, did you hear Miller use the term blivet? If you don't know what a blivet is, it's 10 pounds of a certain substance in an 8-pound bag. As the fight continues, one of the Hayward crew calls for the Master at Arms on shipwide. Malin, Slattery, and the Master at Arms arrive, and O'Connor is thrown into the Master at Arms and rips his keys off of his belt, then drops the keys into Slattery's hand. At Barnes' apartment, Kara and Barnes determine that the red dots on the map are prisons. Just then, a Secret Service agent kicks the door in and shoots Barnes. Kara runs, then sees Barnes' shotgun, runs for it, and kills the agent. What a great stunt here. That shotgun blast takes the agent completely off of his feet and throws him against the wall. Just an excellent sequence there. On the James, Sasha arrives at the lounge where Burke, Green, and Wolf are being held and tells the guard she needs to depose the witnesses. They tell her no, and Slattery arrives, nods at Sasha, and pulls a handgun on one of the guards as Sasha takes the rifle from the other with an excellent hand to the throat. They hand weapons to Burke, Green, and Wolf, and zip-tie the guards inside. Slattery tells them, we do this dry fire, and he removes the rounds from his clip. Sasha and Chandler enter the briefing room, and Malin, seated at the table with his XO and two lieutenants, does not even make eye contact, and tells them to take a seat. Malin asks Chandler for his opening statement, and Chandler delivers an outstanding monologue, explaining that the James was his first command, and that with the virus, all the rules were thrown out. As the speech continues, 
we see the men in the armory gathering weapons and emptying magazines. The men take control of the Hilo Bay, zip tie the guards, and release the pirates. They then take control of CIC and the bridge, and finally they burst into the briefing room. Slattery orders Green to take the officers to the Hilo Bay, and Chandler orders Slattery to set a new course for Japan. Back in the U.S., Kara and Barnes are in a car passing a Welcome to Arkansas sign. They hear on the radio that a warrant is out for their arrest in conjunction with the murders of Rivera and Beatty. The car is then passed by a number of military trucks carrying large blocks of concrete. They come upon construction area and they see that a wall between the regions is being built. I may just be reading into this, but I don't think it's a coincidence that in this episode, Chandler mentions the year 1961, then we see a wall being built dividing a country into pieces. The government of East Germany began construction of the Berlin Wall in August 1961. For this week's well-said moment, as Chandler and Malin watch the Hayward prior to the scuttling, Malin asks if the bridge windows being installed are his, and Chandler tells him they took everything they could use. Malin says, like donating your kid's eyes after a car crash. Ship of the Week The German battleship Bismarck, named after Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, was laid down in Hamburg, Germany in July 1936, launched in February 1939, and commissioned in August 1940. In May 1941, prior to the U.S. entering World War II, Bismarck, under Captain Ernst Lindemann, was assigned to a mission in the Atlantic raiding supplies on the way to Great Britain. During this mission, Bismarck engaged and destroyed the British battlecruiser HMS Hood. As a result of this action, the Royal Navy followed with a furious pursuit of Bismarck that included dozens of warships. On May 26th, Bismarck was struck by a bomb from a British aircraft and the next day was hit repeatedly by shells and torpedoes fired by the British fleet. Following this action, orders were given on board Bismarck to abandon ship and to set charges to scuttle the vessel. After Bismarck went down, many questioned whether she had actually been scuttled. In June 1989, Dr. Robert Ballard located the wreckage of Bismarck. His expedition noted there was no evidence that the ship had imploded in the way an intact ship would due to the tremendous pressure of the water against the air-filled hull. This evidence supports the theory that indeed the crew scuttled the ship before it sank. And that will do it for this week. For all things related to the podcast, including subscription links, previous episodes, and our Patreon link, visit the show notes at thelastshippodcast.com slash s3e10. Our feedback question this week is, will Chandler face any punishment for his actions this week? This sequence of events is very similar to the film Star Trek IV. However, in that case, an admiral, Kirk, saves the world by defying orders. The difference here is those were legal orders. In this case, these are illegal orders being driven by Shaw. Clearly, this is not a legal order to be followed. So the question is, will Chandler face any punishment? In my opinion, should not be any. It'll be interesting what the show does with that. Leave us your answer to that in the comments in the show notes. To see episode 10 again, Visit TNTdrama.com, find it on your cable system's on-demand feature, or download the Watch TNT app. And join me here again next week as I talk about the return of Tex. Until then, thanks for listening. <laughs>